encouraging people to go out to our local uh, outdoor areas and have specific activities for folks to do out there, especially water related kinds of things. So we're really excited about the Wolf Ridge heads up you just gave. And then um, we still have uh, a water education grant program and we have a teacher working on a uh, storm pond buffer planting. And so they've been really good at adapting that to um, having time slots for students to go out and do some of the plantings um, and still maintain social distancing. So people are really working hard to adapt. And um, we have also found that teachers have appreciated a direct email about adopter drain activities and you know other specific things they can give to their kids. And the last thing is we did a community survey and one small water sub watershed. And within that, um, of the people who responded, which was a pretty good turnout rate, they found um, they wanted their information also mainly through the city newsletter. So I think people, we forget that um, print or online the newsletter can be also an important way to get your information out to folks. That's it. Very cool. Emily Johnson, looks like you're next on the list. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Emily. I facilitate the Anoka County Water Resource Outreach Collaborative, and I do outreach for the Anoka SWCD as well. Um, so we're kind of trying to do some virtual tours for the Area 4 SWCD tour, and then helping some partners as well with uh, virtual webinars. Um, we also work with the Anoka County Parks to do kind of a AIS aquatic invasive species learning module for like fifth grade classes so that went over well with the teachers that we shared it with um, and I'm also on the steering committee of the watershed partners thank you excellent um, who's on next it looks like Erica hi <clears throat> I'm Erica with the Nine Mile Creek watershed district I have been busy working to get some of the district's projects implemented, such as some rain gardens. Um, so I think Gail's coming up next, so I'll let her talk about some of our education initiatives. Excellent, Gail, you are up next. Isn't that nice? <laughs> that worked out well. Um, I am the Education and Outreach Coordinator with the Nine Mile Creek Watershed District, and we've been working with Microsoft Teams Live to look into webinar options, so that's been interesting. And I've also been recording different videos that um, I would have done with in-school programs in person, but moving them onto videos. So I've been working with video editing for the first time, which is kind of fun. And um, sending those out to our schools to still um, engage students in outdoor learning. All right, I've got J.A. Cohn, which I'm guessing is Janine Cohn, is that you? If not, I am. hello, how are you doing? Are you, can you hear me? Yep, we can all hear you. Okay, um, well, in the world of Project WET, I'm super excited. Uh, I actually just had a nice talk with Emily yesterday, and um, we have, it's live now, Project WET is online, and you can get a training through Project WET, um, and you can go right to the new web page, it's a brand new one, the very first one, and then it goes um, right underneath the picture. You can click to online training. It takes you to another landing page that gives you the directions on how a person goes through the online training. At the very bottom of that page, you click to get you yourself put into the online training. Right now, I have a, a group of college students that are finishing up their year up at Century Lakes, and they're my guinea pigs, and it's working out really well. And so um, there's different adaptations for different scenarios. And so one of the adaptations that if uh, parents want to take it or a homeschool teacher wants to take it, um, it's set up that they're able to do that. So I've been working with our national office. We have online uh, new lessons that I'll be posting that uh, you know parents and teachers uh, can use with their audiences. Um, so that's. It takes a long time, but it's super exciting. And um, that's kind of the world that we're in right now. And uh, the Mede Makaska, I think maybe a couple of you are on that um, uh, committee that uh, will be taking place next week virtually. And there'll be a small group of us that will be 
um, collecting along make, uh, Mede Makaska for the drumming and the ceremonial part of it. And we'll be recording that for the students that would have taken part in the uh, water festival at, uh, at the lake and they're not able to. And, um, you know, working with the other water festivals and, uh, and most of those are all virtual. So it's a, it's a virtual world of water, but lots of resources coming out of our national office that I'll be sending out to all of you. Um, so if you have any questions, just give me a buzz. And uh, I, I just wanna share the highlight that happened last week uh, or yesterday. I had an eagle in my backyard. So I just wanted to share that that was the most exciting thing that's happened to me in a long time. He <laughs> fished into our backyard and and he and my husband's charging me for the use of the picture that he took and when i send it out so i have to oh hilarious time i send it out <laughs> and i see jana is asking a question yep. Jana, yeah. your hand up. hi everyone i'm so sorry but i'm just noticing that we are completely out of time for this go round so i i'm i apologize for to people who haven't gone yet I think we could either um, just ask people to say their name, their organization, and share like one sentence. If we could do that, we have about two minutes left for this sort of introduction thing. I don't want to take away from the presentation time because I'm, I'm very excited to hear Leslie and Jana's presentation. The other thing I would encourage, maybe everybody can introduce yourself by name and title and then your update on what you're doing, put it in the chat. Everybody can see how you can open the written chat. So that way we could just real quick do like a name and organization super fast and still be able to record that. And I just turned on the recording for the um, meeting so it will also record everything that goes into the chat that we can send that out afterwards. Um, so let's see, Jessica Nelson was next. Hi, <clears throat> hi. I uh, work for the Mississippi National River and Recreation Area, so work really closely with um, Lyndon. And the big thing we've been working on right now is getting some of our formal ed online, including Big River Journey. Uh, and I'm sure Lyndon will be able to speak to that in a lot greater detail. So I'll leave most of that explanation to him. Excellent. And I just realized that I can even real quick unmute people so we don't have quite as much delay on that either. Kevin Strauss, you're up next and unmuted. Hi, I'm Kevin Strauss with Canyon River Watershed Partnership and we're down here in, in Northfield, Minnesota. And similar story to lots of you uh, doing our poster contest online. So people are emailing their stormwater posters to us this year. Awesome, I've got, um, let's see, Kim LeBeau. Good morning, this is Kim LeBeau with the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District, and I'll put my update in chat. Thanks. All right, I've got Catherine with a K. Oh, I can't unmute you, Catherine with a K. That was weird. Um, <laughs> I'm Catherine Keller Miller from the Power Lake Spring Lake Watershed District. Uh, we didn't have a lot of events planned. We didn't have a lot canceled, but I did was just emailing with the teacher this morning and I think we're going to try. I sent them some videos we'd already had on YouTube about some of our programs that they've been using. And I think we're going to do a Google meet to, so that I can kind of chat with the class. So I'm kind of looking forward to that. Very cool. Um, Kim LeBeau. Hi, this is Kim Bo with the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District, and um, I'll put my update in chat. Thanks. All right. Kristen Seaman. Oh, this is Kristen with the City of Woodbury. Nothing else to update. You guys kind of covered same old over here. <laughs> All right. Um, Kristen Meyer. Fire, fresh water, um, lots of innovation coming out of the, the stewards. Um, little fear and trepidation, we're, we're working with them on that too. And um, artists are innovating with their projects as well. Alex um, Van Lowe is not here today because he is fiddling around with our first online virtual moose, which will be at noon today. So tune in to hear, hear that lecture if you can. Um, we did not. Um, 
we are not putting our state of water online uh, because it is an experiential um, event and so we are just waiting with that one and excited to, to throw that one we can all be together very cool i got um lane christensen up next Thank you. I'll be quick. I, I'm with the city of Minneapolis. I manage the Adopt Dream program, the Storm Bain Stenciling program. These are going well. We have a Northeast Minneapolis Adopt Dream Challenge going on. Currently, I have a question for everybody as a group uh, for the cities that have a stenciling program. Uh, what are you doing if you're doing anything? Currently, we're not doing anything, but I'm trying to look at some protocol that would allow me to give things to residents to do some stenciling. So that's all I have. Uh, I'll get back to you. Thank you. All right, I got Lauren Hayden Dries next. Hi, um, I'm with the Washington Conservation District and help provide um, Angie's support through MREP. So she really covered most of my update. Uh, also, just using this time to do some things on the list, such as um, formalizing our cooperative weed management area. So that's our update. Okay, let's see who I've got next. Um, Lindsay Schwantes. I'll be brief. Good to see you. Capital Region Watershed District um, Community Outreach Coordinator and I'll add some comments in the chat. Okay, um, who is up next? Lyndon. Hello, Lyndon Torstenson, National Park Service. Uh, sorry, just trying to uh, turn on my video, but I, I have these um, uh, links actually have been working great. I can't see the chat, but four words, Big oh. River Journey Online. Thanks to those of you who have posted links to our Big River Journey Online. I sent information about that out to the listserv yesterday. Thank you. All right, I got Maya next. Maya is Hope, Education and Outreach Coordinator for the Riley Purgatory Bluff Creek Watershed District. Like everyone else, working on putting everything online into webinars. Um, Megan Jester. Hi, um, I'm the intern at the Nine Creek Watershed District this summer, so just helping come up with creative ways to still connect with people this summer. All right, I've got an M. Vincent. I don't know who the, what the first name is. Okay, Nick Voss. Let's go with Nick Voss. Oh, yeah. Uh, Bay Area Watershed Management Organization. Uh, I'm pushing enter right now. There's my update. And uh, we have a new administrator, Phil Belfiore, is is now oh. uh, settling into Blamo. So wow. this is a new chapter. It's going to be fun. Okay, I got Sage Passy up next. Hi, I'm the education coordinator for Ramsey Washington Metro Watershed District, and I'll put my comments in the chat too. Excellent. Samantha. Conley. Hi, I'm with ICA. Um, not a lot of updates. We're still working on the MS4 permit and everything that comes along with that. And then quickly, I don't know if it's been mentioned, but Cha Tao was on the steering committee. He has left the agency. I will be taking over his spot on the steering committee. Okay, cool. Um, Sharam, Shane. You there, Shane? Okay. We're moving on then. Stephanie from Rochester. I, I pushed my update to the comments, so I will Excellent. let that in there. Okay, I think we're almost to the bottom of the alphabet. Um, we've got, oh, Therese, we already did you. Tracy, how about you, Tracy? For Dean. Okay. And then there's one more person who's a phone number. I don't know who the phone number is. Oh, Tracy did come in. Yeah, hello, Angela. Hello. Uh, we have been doing a lot of work with K-12 Outreach, and uh, we worked with Lyndon with the Big River Journey, which is fantastic, but also made a full-on activity for kids to use, uh, teachers and students to use with the adopt a drain program. And uh, that is available uh, online, as well as our work with uh, the uh, waters for the Sea Mississippi Adventure. I'll put the links to that in the notes. And uh, I don't know if Jan mentioned, but we have had, uh, we just launched the program with the East Coast uh, Water uh, Adopted Drain Program. The city of Seattle is very interested in using our model as well. So 
um, we um, had very positive response from folks around the country of this program. All right. Um, the person who's on the phone, do you want to introduce yourself or shall we move on to the video? Okay, Jana, I'm going to pass it to you to introduce our new video then. Thank you so much, everybody. Even though it was um, hard to share the updates, I think it was really fun to get ideas of what people are doing and um, please share that on the list serve also. And we'll try to learn from one another and get some great ideas from one another. Hi everyone, I hope you can see the screen that I'm sharing. I just wanted to quickly play the new PBS Adopt a Drain uh, video that we're really excited about. And you can easily share this with your people. It's playing on the Adopt a Drain site. It's playing on PBS at tpt.org forward slash drains. And we have a Facebook post. We, I believe we posted on April 30th. If you go to face, Adopt a Drain's Facebook page, which is uh, at Adopt a Drain MN, you can click on the lower right hand uh, side of the screen and share the announcement on your Facebook page. If you would like to share it in another way, let me know. Um, but I'll just play it really quick. It was uh, really fun working on this piece with the people at TBT. Consider the storm drain. Tucked away in the margins of our streets, these openings were designed to carry rainwater and snow melt from our roadways to our waterways as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, they can also serve as an unfiltered pathway for leaves, trash, and other debris. When this stuff reaches our lakes and rivers, it pollutes the water and creates a dangerous environment for us and everything else that depends on it. With over 300,000 drains in the Twin Cities, our waterways are suffering from an avalanche of debris. Even if these items don't go down the drain, rain can extract harmful phosphorus and bacteria and wash them into our lakes and rivers. But by adopting a storm drain and keeping it clean and unobstructed, we can reduce the amount of unwanted material it takes in. We can rake up and compost leaves. We can sweep up sediment, fertilizer, grass clippings, and salt. We can pick up trash and any lawn ornaments left by our pets. And clearing the drain of snow and ice can help keep your community safe for both cars and people during those hazardous winter months. Extending our yard work beyond our lawns, we can all help keep our waterways clean and healthy. There it is. <laughs> All right, do you want to say anything else about it, Jana, or just that it's there? <laughs> it's there and if people have questions about how to announce or view it, please send me an email and I'll be happy to respond. I'd like to move on to Leslie, I just feel like Yes. I really want to hear the presentation. So. Okay. Um, I agree because we already had to postpone our presentation from Leslie and Jennifer an entire month. Um, so uh, without further ado, Leslie Yetka and Jana Kiefer will be talking about climate change and rainfall. Where can, should, will all of the water go? And I'm going to go ahead and mute myself and turn off my screen and turn things over to the two of you, okay? All right. Um, if you guys can't hear me, hopefully Angie or Jana, you can uh, tell me, but I'm gonna try to share my screen here. Hopefully this works. And I'll keep my video on. If it looks like it's gumming things up, I'll let me know and I can turn it off. But, uh, Thanks for having us. I know we got pushed back from the last time, which is unfortunate, but uh, we'll adapt as we all have been doing um, since we've started the stay at home business. Um, but I'm Leslie Yetta. I am the Natural Resources Manager with the City of Minnetonka. And um, I've been here with the city for about a year and many of you I, I know, so it's uh, exciting to see all of you again, uh, at least virtually. 
Um, and then Jana is also, uh, she'll be speaking uh, after me. We're going to tag team here. So she'll introduce herself uh, a bit when she gets on. But uh, was somebody trying to say something? Can you guys hear me? Okay, I'll go. Um, so wanted to talk a little bit about climate change and rainfall. Uh, and the title here is Where Can, Should, Will All the Water Go? Which is kind of a long, confusing title, but um, it kind of captures hopefully what we're trying to talk about today, which is um, dealing with uh, rainfall, uh, stormwater runoff, and uh, kind of addressing it at multiple scales, uh, recognizing that it's changing, we're getting more of it. And it brings up a lot of uh, new questions in terms of how cities and communities deal with, uh, deal with the rainfall that we're having. At least we especially had last year. So we're going to talk a little bit, I'm going to talk a little bit about climate change and community adaptation. I'll keep it pretty brief. Uh, then Jana is going to actually um, get more in depth in some of the work that she's doing. Uh, she's been doing some exciting work with um, multiple organizations uh, and so kind of give us a little bit of an update on sort of where, kind of where we're at with regard to adaptation planning. And then I'll come back and, and then talk uh, more specifically about education and outreach needs and sort of at least what I'm seeing here uh, at the city and working with other partners um, that we're, we've been working with. Um, and just to reiterate, a lot of this is based on my own perceptions. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, I have worked in climate resilience work for a, a while. I used to work with the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District and that was back in uh, 2013 when we actually worked uh, with some researchers from out east on a stormwater adaptation study uh, related to climate change and uh, looking at vulnerability and identifying adaptation options uh, specifically related to stormwater infrastructure. And it was an interesting experience uh, working uh, because that was back in 2013. And so, Things have changed a lot, uh, it seems, in some ways, in some ways not so much, but um, I'm going to use sort of that background just as a backdrop for some of my um, opinions and perceptions for what's changed uh, since 2013. But um, just to give a little bit of a background on climate adaptation planning, just to make sure we're still on, all on the same page. Um, one thing that the study that I worked on in 2013, we really focused on was this sort of cycle of adaptation planning. Um, and just so that everyone is familiar with this, um, it's really about identifying what uh, vulnerabilities, uh, well, basically what, what risk is at play with communities related to, uh, in, the, in this case, related to water. Um, what are some of the vulnerabilities that communities and even watershed uh, districts and watershed management organizations face? Um, and then identifying what are some of the strategies that can be used or should be used um, to address some of those vulnerabilities that have been identified. And then, you know, monitoring and evaluating um, kind of where, uh, what's been working, what hasn't been working and using that to uh, kind of go back and inform uh, uh, maybe a different change in course or uh, uh, staying on the same path. So it's, it's a really, it's an iterative adaptive management cycle. And this quote I have, which at the moment is hidden by my window of my speakers, so I got to have to move that. Um, I don't know if hopefully you can't see it, but anyway, um, the adaptation planning process, uh, which, you know, I think a lot of us are probably have been involved in to some degree, but maybe not necessarily know it. But this process is really, um, there's a lot of things that are dependent on whether it's successful or not. And, and really it comes down to, you know, political will, uh, economic resources and capacity, uh, you know, tolerance for change and tolerance for risk and then capacity for communities to respond. And so that's the whole capacity building uh, component that's sort of at the top, if you can see my cursor. Um, you know, that's, and, and the real, I think, take home lesson with uh, understanding this adaptation planning cycle or process is, is that it's very dependent uh, on local specifics, the community, 
uh, makeup, um, community norms, you know, community political uh, status, um, equity issues. And so there's a lot that goes into that. So there's not a one size fits all um, when it comes to adaptation planning, which I know Jana's gonna talk about more as well. But I thought this was kind of interesting. I talked about this study I had worked on in 2013. Um, and I'm not gonna go into the details of that study, but one thing that's interesting when I look at what, where we were at back in the you know, early 2010s versus now, um, as related to adaptation planning, you know, we're in a different place, but I, 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 in terms of kind of how far we've come, but I thought this was interesting just for everyone's uh, information. Um, the information that I'm showing here on this slide is from EcoAdapt, which is an organization you can go to. There's a, the, web, the website is ecoadapt.org. And they have a kind of a state of climate adaptation um, uh, publication. And it's interesting, I think, to note that if you look at this image, um, we are, here's the different parts of the adaptation cycle, the impact assessment, vulnerability, planning, capacity building. Um, one thing that I think is interesting is that we, uh, I would assume everybody would hopefully agree that Climate change is definitely at more at the forefront of our conversation, um, both, uh, you know, even federally, not that the response has been good, but the, the conversation is there, uh, certainly locally, um, you know, I'm, I'm hearing much more talk about climate adaptation, uh, even in our own community, and recognition of that it's an issue. But in terms of where we are at in this sort of planning and adaptation cycle, um, we're still, um, we're still doing a lot of trying to figure out what the problem is. Um, so I'm not gonna read these quotes, but in general, if you look even nationwide, with the, which is what they've done, we're still in that impact assessment phase. Um, we're still at, um, you know, there's a lot of data collection that's going on. Um, also a lot of understanding what are the vulnerabilities. Um, and even starting to, you know, doing the planning, a lot of climate adaptation plans are coming out. Um, from you know Minneapolis and St. Paul and and other local uh, communities, uh, as you know, comp plans, the municipal comprehensive plan process uh, included a resilience chapter this year. Is sort of the uh, uh, not this year, but when they were going through the recent cycle, uh, watershed district comp plans are also including resilience. And so there's a lot of that planning and and data collection going on. Um, but from their perspective, there's still uh, a lot of activity that needs to happen in the capacity building phase and even in the implementation phase and certainly in the uh, mo the uh, monitoring and evaluation phase. So um, I just give this background to kind of help people or, or sort of spark the uh, thinking and, and maybe we, at the end of this we can have some conversation about, um, you know, in this process of adaptation planning, um, I know I've seen changes happen over the years, especially from the first time we did this study in terms of um, there's a lot more planning going on and there's certainly a lot of activity happening implementation, which is what um, Jan is gonna talk about. But there's still so much we don't know. Um, there's still uh, so much that happens that's, that is dependent on local conditions that there's not a one size fits all. And, and then in terms of how much we're actually implementing, in terms of practices, so thinking of like stormwater uh, infrastructure upgrades and things like that, the monitoring and evaluation, we're still, you know, we have a long way to go to make sure we understand which strategies are most successful um, versus other strategies. And so um, I just wanted to give this a sort of an interesting kind of brief overview of sort of the state of the climate adaptation uh, process in, in our area and also sort of um, nationwide. Just because I think it's interesting that I feel I feel good and hopeful that we've come a long way, but we still have a lot of work to do. So, um, just to ground us specifically in in uh, stormwater and water resource um, and climate change and adaptation work, um, Jan's going to talk more about this. But overall, you know, I'm not going to go into climate science and and where we're at in terms of Minnesota's changing climate, but the 
the, um, the, the main thing you need to know, if you don't already, is that we're becoming warmer and we're becoming wetter. Um, this, is the, this graph shows the uh, average rainfall uh, total per decade. And as you can see, uh, this past decade has been higher than ever. And last year, we had the wettest year on record. Um, we had actually almost an extra year's worth of rain uh, last year. And it's interesting because I'm sure everybody hears that we're getting more rain more frequently or more intense storms more frequently. However, last year it was um, actually more about smaller storms that just were back to back to back. And the stormwater, from a stormwater perspective, our infrastructure and the system just didn't get a chance to sort of push the water through and, 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 and reset itself. So that's why we had a lot of local flooding. Um, in terms of Minnetonka, we had, um, and we had flooding issues everywhere, as I'm sure many people did. We had our wetlands were full, our stormwater ponds were full. We have landlocked basins that were uh, exceptionally high. And so um, it was interesting how the conversation um, shifted suddenly from less about water quality issues and, and almost solely focused on water quantity and where are we going to put this water. And so, um, you know, how are we going to, how do we plan for things like this when, uh, you know, we're sort of caught off guard by this uh, very wet year um, and trying to solve issues without being able to really see the big picture because, um, you know, as, as, as we often do, we tend to be more reactive than proactive. And so, just grappling with those questions about where does this water going to go? Where should it go? It brings up a lot of issues with regard to risk and vulnerability. Um, what does the, um, you know, what is, from a city's perspective, what do we consider uh, a risk? Is it to life and to property? And from a citizen's perspective, it may be about their, um, you know, yard underwater uh, or their, you know, uh, jungle gym underwater, which we had a lot of calls about that. And, and so, you know, we have to prioritize what's at risk and what's not, and 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 then also use this as an opportunity to spur more uh, investigation and, and data collection back in that uh, kind of data collection part of the adaptation process into what are we going to do now, uh, and what are we going to, you know, what if this is the driest year we have in the next 10 years, what are we going to do, which luckily it's been pretty dry this year, so. We haven't had that happen yet, but but anyway, you know, just it's interesting to see how the conversation has changed. Um, that sense of urgency has changed dramatically from 2013, the, the original study I worked on, to now. Um, people are seeing obviously out their back door issues with if, with water, is certainly quantity of water, um, and so that that sense of urgency has increased quite a bit. Uh, certainly it's in the media, uh, you know, neighbors talk about it. Uh, even in, from a political perspective, I know every community is different. Uh, here in Minnetonka, I would say, um, I'm pleased to find that we have a majority, even in our city council, that will openly and willingly talk about climate change and, and the need and the urgency for climate adaptation uh, and mitigation work. So, um, and with that, I think uh, I'm going to turn it over to Jana. So that was the intent was just to kind of give us a grounding of kind of where we're at. Uh, Jana's going to talk more about specific work that she's doing, and then I'll come back and talk about some of the needs that I see in the education and outreach realm. And I'm going to figure out how to get out of here. I'm going to stop mm -hmm. sharing my screen, and Jana, I'll let you share. All right. Um, first of all, uh, can you hear me? Um, how does the audio sound? If anybody can let me know. Yep. It's, I think it sounds Great. good. Great. Um, well, thanks for having me today. Um, it's fun to see a lot of familiar faces on this call and then also see some new ones. Um, so again, thank you. Let's see. Let me pull up my presentation. Sorry, bear with me here a sec. You know, I've done this so many times, I think I'd be quicker on the draw. All right. Um, so 
I'm going to try to zip through this a little bit just because we're a little short on time. But I'm going to start off by showing this graph or this um, yeah, graphic that this is something that Bar developed several years ago now. Um, as we started, you know, hearing from clients the question, what is what is climate change? What does climate change mean for for me and my organization, my city, my watershed, and and how should we be preparing for it? And so, this is a um, process that we put together that just kind of helps. At least it helps me kind of look at the issue. It's a big climate change is a big issue, and so this kind of helps break it down a little bit into smaller pieces. And so I think this can can be used also to take a look at you know if we're thinking about you know, climate change manifests itself in, in a lot of different ways. And one of the big ones, especially in Minnesota, is flooding and from extreme, you know, changes in in precipitation patterns and extreme storm events. And so really you start off by this question of what are we noticing now? Because that's something people can grab onto and you know everybody, you know, everybody's living in this world and they can uh, they can relate to what they you know what they saw in their own lives related to big storms or um, other climate changes. So that's a good place to start with folks and um, and then take it, you know, down the step of, you know, well, what what could happen? You know, we can get some extreme storms and what does that mean, you know, for our city, for our infrastructure, for flooding? Um, so this is just something that um, we like to use and you may find it useful as well. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what some of my work with various clients has been around trying to understand and adapt to the increases in precipitation, extreme precipitation. And so I'm going to start off by talking about this first step, what is what are we noticing now? And this sort of correlates with, with Leslie's this previous slide that was showing impact assessment. So what are what are we seeing? Or what could we see? Um, you know, as this is just a picture of, uh, of an area, I think this is in Bloomington where um, the state highway is underwater. You know, here's some fascinating pictures out of Duluth during the superstorm, and at the top here, you can see that our, you know, the the timeline of our historic mega events has is really accelerated in the last decade or two. And then, as Leslie mentioned, this is uh, just some photos of uh, what we're experiencing now as a result of of last year, and it being such a wet year. Again, not related to specific events per se, but just rain, you know, rain, rain and more rain and more rain. And so, um, and I think that that's kind of an important distinction as you're, out, you know, talking with your, with people about flooding is, you know, there can be different types of flooding. Sometimes your flooding might be related to that big storm we get that comes in, in a flash. And sometimes the flooding might be just more related to landlocked basins and, and the, the wet periods we've been having. So you've probably heard a lot about Atlas 14, um, and it's in the water world that I work in. And I guess I forgot I, I should step back and introduce myself. Um, I have been uh, working at VAR for almost 20 years now, and um, primarily working in um, related, just doing analysis, uh, hydrologic and hydrologic, hydraulic and hydraulic modeling, and um, flood studies and also do a fair amount of water quality work. And so I've been working with cities for the past couple of decades, navigating you know, the various flood, flooding issues. Um, in 2013, NOAA uh, released what was called Atlas 14. And so prior to that, as when we were looking at design storms, we would use um, numbers that were coming out of a report called Technical Paper 40, which was issued by the US Weather Bureau in 19. 61, I believe. And so um, this graph shows the kind of dark, the brownish um, bars are, are the precipitation depth for various return frequency storms under PP40. So for example, a 10 year storm would, the, a 10 year 24 hour storm was 4.1 inches. So in 2013, NOAA released Atlas 14, which was essentially um, an update to PP40. And so they brought in, you know, several numerous decades more of data, and they also used some more advanced um, data processing methods to relook at the numbers. And so this sort of shook the water resources world quite a bit because, as you can see in this graph, there's some significant uh, increases here. For example, the 100-year, 24-hour event 
used to be six inches in the Minneapolis uh, Twin Cities area, and now it's seven and a half. And that's about a 25% increase, which, um, which is a lot in the world of flooding. And as you can see, when you look at the 500 year, instead of it being 7.1 inches, it's now up at 10.6. Um, so this really has been has been a big change to how communities are um, taking a look at their flooding. You know, many of the communities try to design their systems and to provide what we call a hundred year level of protection for residents. And that used to be based on six inches, you know, the six inch storm in 24 hours and now it's seven and a half. So people, there's a lot of people um, that used to be provided that 100, level, 100 year level of protection who now um, statistically aren't anymore because of this change. This is just a zoom in of that, of that data. And what I wanted to show here, so this is the 100 year, 24 hour storm. And you'll see that Atlas 14 is at, is at about seven and a half inches, but I also have this black bar on there. And so that is showing, um, that's showing that the 50th percentile, you know, looking statistically at the data from Atlas 14, the 50th percentile indicates seven and a half inches, but this bar shows the difference between the fifth percentile and the 95th. So it could be anywhere from, you know, 5.5 to 10 inches. Um, so that also just indicates that there's not only did our um, precipitation estimate increase, but there's also a lot of uncertainty around the extent of it. So what, so I'm just going to talk through um, some of the municipal and watershed scale adaptation efforts that have been going on. Um, I just tend to do a lot more work in the West Metro, so I'm going to give some examples today of, of some of the West Metro communities and watershed districts, but um, certainly there's a lot of, of, of work going on throughout the entire metro area. Um, so many of the metro cities and watershed districts and watershed or management organizations have really um, taken the first step, which I think is a really important step, and they've invested in modeling to understand, to really understand what the flood impacts are under Atlas 14. And I do want to commend the, the water management organizations and watershed districts because I think they've really um, served as leaders in this area. Um, jumping on, you know, when Atlas 14 came out, many of these organizations jumped on it right away and started um, building models or using their models to, to help communities understand what this means for them. And so that's a really important tool. Another important tool is then taking those results out of the model and mapping them. So you can um, geographically see the impact and, and, and figure out ways to help um, identify the impact and identify the consequences of those impacts. So this is just an example of um, watershed scale modeling. And so as I mentioned, many of the watershed districts and organizations have taken a first uh, cut at the modeling. This is an example of a um, floodplain mapping that was done for Nine Mile Creek Watershed District. Um, and so you can see here that this is looking at, a, you know, broadly at what's happening along the creek system as part of as Atlas 14 happens. And now here's a zoomed in example. So this is an example from the city of Bloomington, um, where they um, then took the district model and then they added some additional detail and to, to help understand, actually this map is, this is a model that they, the city developed on their own, excuse me, but they, um, this is showing where they've gone to a different level of detail and really dived into the, to the details and shown, done inundation mapping to show where they would have flooding. This is in the Mall of America area. And on here, the blue is showing the 100 year Atlas 14 inundation and the purple lines are showing the TP40. So it gives you a, um, understanding of the extent of change. This is just another example from Bloomington, and, and what I thought was interesting here is that just really, you know, the flooding is happening everywhere, not only in retail areas, but also large industrial areas and residential areas as well. You know, here's a here's a large watershed that or a residential area that that's shown inundated. And here's just another example of, of, of mapping of the modeling results. This is an area in Edina and along um, a railroad corridor where, where they would be inundated under that Atlas 14 event. And there's another example just showing um, taking the modeling results and putting it into a map. It's much more impactful when you can you know, see visually where the flooding would be happening versus putting the numbers in a table.
So this is just a little bit of what's been going on. Um, you know, many cities and watershed districts have taken that first step. And I will say that Atlas 14 has been a big deal for communities. It's a big change. And so at least the communities that I'm working with are really still grappling with Atlas 14 and what to do about that. And so um, when you start talking about climate change and that those numbers are going to continue to increase, it's pretty overwhelming for, for folks. And so um, there has been some watershed districts that have start, started to look forward, you know, say, okay, well, what Atlas 14 is completely looking backwards. And so um, at data that we've already experienced. And so, you know, looking forward, you know, some watershed districts have, and water management organizations have started doing that. But I mean, in my, experience a lot of the cities are still trying to just get their arms around Atlas 14. So this is just looking at what could happen next. And so um, as I just mentioned, Atlas 14 is completely looking backwards. But there was Leslie at the beginning of the um, discussion here today, Leslie mentioned a study that she worked on um, when she was at the, the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District. And that was um, funded through NOAA, I believe. And the results of this study were really important. And it was, at least I was really excited to see the results of the study because nobody had put a number to what climate change could look like for us here in Minnesota as far as what it means for storm events. And so these, these give us some pretty good, it's a good idea. And so as you'll see here, um, of course my screen is, oh, there we go, on top of it. But um, you'll see here that there's several, um, diamonds showing up for the mid 21st century predictions that came out of this study. And it's, the green is, is a low, um, the, the gold color is a moderate prediction, and the, the red color is a the pessimistic prediction. Those are all related to how, um, what kind of mitigation efforts would happen um, in the future. So as you can see, um, the projections for mid-century are showing quite a significant potential significant increase in precipitation. And one thing I do want to just, excuse me, just note is that when you're looking at this rainfall, this moderate mid 21st century estimate sort of aligns with this upper 95th percentile range of the Atlas 14. And so sometimes what we've been doing is talking a little bit more using this upper bound from the Atlas 14 as it's kind of a surrogate for what we could expect under climate change. It just makes the conversation a little bit easier to steer it back to existing data versus um, projection. So I mentioned that some watershed um, or management organizations have taken that next step to start looking at what um, climate change can mean to them in the world of flooding. And this is an example from the Riley Purgatory Bluff Creek Watershed District. Um, several years ago now already, they, they uh, undertook a floodplain vulnerability evaluation. And so they modeled a range of rainfall events, um, a 5.5, a 7.4 inch, and a 10 inch. And then they mapped it and they layered them on, on top of each other. And so that's what you can see on this slide. And it's pretty interesting to see the difference. You know, in some places there's not a a, a huge difference in the inundation that will occur, but in some places, um, you know, it can make a big, a big difference. And so, as you can see, too, they they did an intersection with the inundation layer and the home and the road crossing to help figure out which homes would be at risk under these various storms. And so, um, you know, those that were would show up as red, which we don't have any red homes on this screen, but those would be impacted in all three of these storms. The yellow would be impacted in the 7.4 inch event and the 10 and the blue homes would be impacted in the 10 inch event. So this was a really great start to starting to look and, and just answering that question, what will happen if we get that storm, that bigger 10 inch storm, you know, how bad will it be? You know, where, you know, and you know, I don't, nobody, I haven't heard other, anybody really seriously talking about managing to these future projections or these, these like a 10 inch rainfall event. But I think it's really important to ask to be considering like what could happen as you look at design options. So um, now just going back to our process here, um, 
you know, people are starting to to try to really answer, move move down the, the process to, uh, you know, start understanding, you know, what these things will mean to them and their cities and communities and their watershed and how vulnerable are they to it? And then what can we do? You know, let's start, start developing some strategies and engaging your community to help um, figure out what adaptation looks like for a given community. Um, one of the clients I'm working with right now at Hennepin County is, is taking a, a closer look at climate change adaptation and we're helping them with a vulnerability assessment. And so, you know, vulnerability can be about the risk, you know, what is your, your flood risk and, and, you know, will it, you know, how many, in, how many structures within your city are going to be impacted, for example, but it really is also about um, the sensitivity to those risks and then your capacity to adapt. So the conversation ar around vulnerability is a little bit more broad. It, it's, um, it's really about um, whether, you know, whether there are certain disparities um, within your community that may um, make those, you know, portions of your community more sensitive to flooding. Um, you know, maybe you have a, a large group of residents that rely on public transportation and your bus stops are underwater. Um, that's going to be a problem. Or maybe you have a large, you know, portion of rental housing um, or low income housing and they, you know, those are the areas that are at the greatest flood risk. Those are important things to be aware of because it's going to affect their, um, their sensitivity to the risk and also the ability for them to, to adapt and to um, adjust as, as these um, impacts happen. So communication is another important part of, of this moving forward and, and developing adaptation strategies. And so we've been trying to figure out um, different ways to communicate flood information. It's pretty technical. And so people don't always have a clear understanding of what it means to them. And so this is one way that we developed. It's showing annual flood risk. And so, you know, this is showing an intersection that floods and it's showing you on any given year, what is your risk for flooding? And so it, you know, it spells out on a parcel by parcel basis, you know, how, you know, how often you could expect to be getting wet. This is another kind of different way to show it that um, helps put it into perspective that um, this is actually that same intersection. And this is helping people understand, okay, in the, in the lifetime of your mortgage, in, you know, in 30 years, what is the chance that you would get wet in a given, you know, in a given area or a given parcel? And so it, it just helps them understand, um, kind of getting back at what Leslie mentioned, that tolerance for risk and, um, you know, it helps people really understand the likelihood of the risk. This is another example from the city of Edina. Um, the, this is a, a, I think it's a new site that they have out on the web. It's called What is My Flood Risk? So it's a pretty cool site. This is showing, um, you know, you can zoom in to find your house and it will really help you understand um, what your flood risk is under a 10 year event and a 100 year event and it's pretty user friendly. Um, other, you know, a big part of this is in figuring out adaptation strategies is engaging your community. And so um, one, one of the things is through some community resilience workshops, which really just are, are, are a great way to start the conversation with your community. This photo is an example for one that um, Riley Purgatory Bluffs Creek Watershed District and the Nine Mile Creek Watershed District um, got a grant and the Freshwater Society got a grant through the MPCA and that council to, to put on a series of workshops. And so this is an example of um, folks from the city of Edina at a table working together to evaluate what the threats and opportunities from, from climate change and adaptation strategies. Um, this is another, just another way to engage community stakeholders. The city of Edina recently has um, developed a task force, a flood risk reduction task force. And so they were really pulled together a group to help. You know, they're at the point where they have modeling results. They have a good understanding of what it means, you know, the extent of flooding throughout their city. And so then they were really looking for some guidance on, you know, what, what does the community think about what direction we should go with this and what you know what strategies we should employ so they pulled together a flood risk reduction task force um that's i think still in process or toward the end of that process and so um you know, jessica wilson would would be a good 
a resource if you have questions about that. This is another example of some um, putting together, kind of looking towards those next steps, um, is some flood risk reduction and mitigation strategies. And what I think is really important here is what Leslie mentioned, which is really one size does not fit all here. Um, you know, you have, you have, you'll probably, in many cities, you have hundreds of, of impacted homes and uh, impacted areas. And in some of those areas, you'll be able to, what the city of Edina here called, modify the flood. Uh, you know, in some ways, you, you might be able to engineer, engineer your way out of them, but there's going to be other places where that's either not feasible or just not cost effective. And so there's going to be different strategies um, related to redevelopment and um, things that can change as part of redevelopment or also, um, you know, flood proofing, you know, if, all, if other options aren't proving to be feasible or economical, you know, maybe flood proofing is an option. So this is just a nice um, table that they have in their comprehensive water resources management plan that just starts to identify the different strategies and, and potential actions that could could be used for the various flooding problems. Um, this is an example from the city of Minnetonka and um, we've been working with them to update their modeling for Atlas 14 and Minnetonka is, is unique because it has so many water bodies and it's just a really complicated network of, of um, water bodies and storm sewer throughout their city. And so, you know, again, the, the impacts from Atlas 14 are pretty significant. And so the city has been looking at ways that they can look into the future and try to make modifications to their system to reduce the impact. So in this example, this is an example of some mapping that we did to identify places where there's additional capacity and places that's shown in purple and places where um, there's public land shown in green. And can we utilize um, some of that public land to get more storage, you know, where, you know, where are we going to put all this water? Well, um, the public lands may be one of the better places to store that water to minimize impact to the, to the private uh, structures. And then also, um, I think when we're thinking about next steps here um, and, and flood risk reduction mitigation strategies, I think an important thing here is, is in a, an important opportunity or role for the watershed organizations is to take a big picture approach and um, you know be a partner, work together with your with your communities to try to figure out ways that we can you know reduce the impacts to the most people. Um, this is an image of Nine Mile Creek Watershed District, and they're currently in conversations and discussions trying to figure out you know what what can they do. Um, you know, a lot of these localized flooding issues may be more of the city issue, but what can they do as a watershed to to try to um, alleviate or make room in the, in the creek system or, or add additional floodplain capacity so some of this water can, you know, can be pushed downstream. And so just looking, working, trying to work together to figure out um, solutions that can um, work for the most people. So that's it. That's all I have. I kind of um, zipped through that, but I want to uh, just show you some examples of what, of what um, some communities are doing, and then I'm going to turn it back over to Leslie. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Jana. Uh, I think you need to stop sharing your screen. Actually, I think I can do it for you. Um, and as Jana mentioned, she talked about, you know, modifying the flood, you know, just to sort of reiterate the complexity of dealing with, uh, you know, flood and, and water issues is the uh, city of Minnetonka example she showed, um, you know, one of the perfect solutions would be to send, take all of the extra water and send it down into the Nine Mile Creek watershed district, uh, or Nine Mile Creek, and then that just brings, I mean, is literally sending it downstream. And so it brings the complexity, enhances the complexity for the watershed district who's managing all of the cities and all of their separate needs and priorities. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't envy Jana's work, her job, <laughs> in terms of finding those uh, solutions because she also works with the Nine Mile Creek Watershed District. But um, I just wanted to kind of bring it back um, in terms of, you know, everything that Jana was talking about was basically a, a lot of vulnerable, 
vulnerability assessments and, and data collection and some planning. And so if you remember what I was talking about first, sort of that, that cycle of adaptation planning and where we're spending a lot of effort uh, and time and resources is on that planning and data collection uh, and assessment phase. And so that sort of, um, so that kind of what she talked about demonstrates that. But the other part of implementation and evaluation and monitoring, um, you know, we're, we're, we're doing that obviously all the time in terms of anytime we're doing projects, uh, putting in projects, we're trying to solve uh, solve the problems that are being created through climate change and the increased rains that we're having. But in terms of what, because this is an audience of a lot of educators and, and people who do community engagement work, um, for this specific audience and, and where we need to have uh, even more work happening is that, is that capacity building arena. And um, so I just put in some ideas here and, and love if we have time to hear from others. But, you know, one thing that I think everybody here probably agrees is that we need to continue to be hosting community conversations around uh, climate change and impacts and, and vulnerability and who's, you know, who, who, what is the, how do we define risk? Um, it depends on, you know, who you're talking to. Um, what are the priorities? What are the achievable strategies given our political climate and our resources available? You know, we need to be continuing to have these conversations so that everybody is on board. So when we get these severe uh, flood events and we get really wet years and we've got people, you know, calling on the phone, wanting uh, the city to come in and get the water off their property. And, you know, we're dealing with, you know, as Jana said, in Minnetonka, we have hundreds and hundreds of uh, wetlands and, and pond area, low areas, low lying areas and ponds, and we have flooding everywhere. And so just that a conversation around, you know, defining risk and is a garden or play structure underwater the same as somebody's uh, basement flooding? And where should we be putting our effort and where should we be putting our resources and, and where should our city council be um, you know, approving funding for projects and not approving funding for projects. So just having those conversations, I think we need to continue to do that, um, whether it's hosted conversations or whether it's uh, social media. Uh, we just need to be, be finding ways to continue to have these conversations in our communities. And then sparking collaboration. Uh, watershed districts and cities, uh, there's obviously a lot of synergy when it comes to water and water management. And watershed districts are really good at modeling and have a lot of data and certainly uh, oftentimes have funding available. Um, cities have land and cities have infrastructure and, and manage a lot of the infrastructure. So finding ways to work together, uh, I think actually educators and, and communicators can help um, bring to light some of those opportunities. And so I think uh, you all have a role to play in that. And then trying to really uh, educate uh, and enlighten citizens, uh, people who have land and may be experiencing flooding, um, what they can do, they all have a role to play. Um, they can prepare for uh, wet years, um, making sure their sump pumps are running, or if they have areas they wanna protect, if it's not their home, but it's, uh, you know, it's a play structure, maybe they need to think about moving it. Um, I just think, you know, we haven't, what I found here when I came to the city is, you know, we weren't communicating at all about flood risk um, really uh, comprehensively with with residents. And so um, I know the district, uh, Jana mentioned City of Edina, they've been taking uh, a lot of leadership in providing communication tools for communicating with residents. Uh, the watershed districts also um, can help uh, provide some of that information that I know cities can then make use of. So I think there's a lot that citizens can do. Uh, I think we need to help them understand what they can do and and what actions they can take. And then sustainable landscape practices, I think that's at the heart of a lot of what we already educate about and that's still equally important now and, and even more so. So I, we need to obviously keep doing what we're doing with regard to things like adopter drain and and you know native plantings and um, putting in uh, green infrastructure practices, capturing rainwater, things like that. So we need to keep that up as well. So with that, my last one is other thoughts and ideas. So 
I think uh, hopefully we have some time to um, gather some input and, and if people have questions, we can certainly answer them. But that's all that I wanted to say and I appreciate the opportunity. I know Jana does too and uh, I'll turn it back over to Angie. Okay, everyone, we have just a few more minutes until it's 11 o'clock. So it looked like there was a few questions that came in through the chat, Leslie and Jana, if we want to try to pick through these in identifying possible flooding through these modeling practices. Has that created any problems with residents needing to purchase flood mm -hmm. insurance that haven't had to in the past? Yes, I would say that's definitely um, part of part of what. So part of it is there's been areas identified that would need flood insurance now under FEMA. I think also what we've identified is a lot of these areas that are flooding now are are localized areas, and they haven't historically been included in FEMA's. You know, FEMA's flood maps are more focused on 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 streams and rivers and large water bodies, and so it's a situation where they could get flood insurance, but they may not be. And they probably should get flood insurance, but they may may not. Um, it wouldn't be, you know, required under FEMA. So it's it, it's a mixed bag of both of those situations. Okay. Um, question: Will this video be shared with the group? Since I am recording, then we can send it out to the listserv. Um, but there's also a question: If it's possible to get copies of just the slides as a PowerPoint or a PDF? Yeah. I uh, I won't speak for Jana, but I can share those as a PDF. Okay. All right, here's another question. When having these community conversations, how do you work in equity for those underrepresented, especially since lower income communities tend to be more impacted, but often less represented at the community meetings? Well, I guess one thing I would say is, um, a, you know, a community meeting might not be the best way to actually um, bring people who are, you know, underserved audiences into the conversation. So I think we need to get creative and what we mean by when we say community conversations. Uh, you know, I know there's convenings that happen. We hosted workshops. Uh, I worked with Jana on those workshops. Um, and, you know, the truth is, is that the people who are in the room are not necessarily representing the underserved audiences. So. I know Minneapolis has done a lot of work on um, hosting different kinds of conversations. And um, I don't know if Abby Moore has been, if she's still on, if she's had some participation in those, um, being that you're in Minneapolis or Lane Christensen maybe can have some response to that. But I just think, I think we need to get creative in how we convene, um, how we get their stories told, how we um, involve them in the process. Excellent. One thing I'll add there. Anything you is, want to add, Jana? <laughs> um, sorry, I would just I would just say that um, I also think it's really um, I think it's good. You know, just it's part of the responsibility of of cities uh, staff and um, decision makers. And you know, I, was, I mentioned we're working with the county on a vulnerability assessment, and they are really really focused. Kind of the county is really focused on on disparities and what that means. You know, how the impacts of climate change are are exacerbated for um, individuals with various disparities. And so I think that's encouraging to hear that. And so I think, you know, looking for better ways to get them part of the conversation and then also making sure that those are part of the conversations on staff levels, I think are, are two good ways. Excellent. Well, we have hit 11 o'clock. And so I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Thank you so much, Leslie and Jana, for your presentation. That was mm -hmm. great. Thank you so much to everybody who joined the meeting today. Um, here, I'll turn myself back on again, then you can see me, and I'm not just a disembodied voice. Uh, continue to use that listserv to share the ideas of the new things that you're trying out. I think we can all learn from one another. Like I said, we'll post this recording on YouTube and send out a link so you can access the, um, the chat and the conversation that we had later. Um, and I think 
we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting then. Thank you everybody so much for joining us. All right. Today. Thank you. Thank Good you. to see everybody. Bye y'all. Bye.